Thank you for that. Let's just click on record. There we go. Everybody can hear us just a quick thumbs up. Yay. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. I think let's get straight into it. Uh, very interesting subject today. I'm very excited. Uh, let's do a little bit of formalities and introductions for those that might be uh, viewing the video later for the first time. Welcome, everybody. My name is Eddie Michaelis. I am the founder and the CEO of the Mahi Pilotomo Cancer Project. Joining me today is director and co-founder John Kominos. Thank you, John. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Evie. <laughs> it was a nice introduction. I missed my cue, but it's a pleasure to be here. It's very nice to meet you both. Thank you for having me on here. It's a pleasure and it's an absolute privilege to have you on board. And I'm sure we're going to be very educated today with stuff that we don't even know about. So we're really excited. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And with that, and with that um, our introduction to our guest speaker today is Kiara Bergstrom. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. It's Bergstrom, but I'm used to a lot of people going Bergstrom, so it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. And a very exciting topic today. We're chatting about integrative medicine and cancer treatment. So a topic that I had to go and Google and uh, get my resources in place <laughs> because it's such an exciting uh, topic, which then opened up a whole array of questions. So we've got some Q&A. Yeah. And well, that's fantastic. I love Q&A. So... Awesome. And what, what we'll do is as we're going along, um, please, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand or alternatively, there's a little chat box at the bottom that you can put your questions in. But I think without any delay, um, over to you, Kiara, if you can just do a little brief intro into who you are, where you're from. And um, yeah, we'll follow through. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I've been working with Professor Carol Baines and whew, I think for about 19 years now. And I head up the research and the complementary health because, sorry, <laughs> it's a huge passion of mine. And I'm currently studying medicine at Bits Medical School and I run the Pink Parasol, which is the only website of its kind in South Africa that lists all complementary and conventional therapists that are trustworthy and will help the patient get through their treatment instead of trying to sway them in a direction we majority see that doesn't work so that's what i do sure very nice and of course prof ben always very special to us and one of our preferred um, breast surgeons uh, yes. very well known i'm sure to many many that might be listening um and uh, also nicole fuller also worked very closely and um together with prof ben and nicole is yes. our cancer navigator so yes yeah, lovely to hear that in a long long time sure <laughs> very long. I've been doing this very, very long. I think that's why I'm also excited to study medicine and just be able to do more. So, Kiara, just to kick it off, may I ask you a question? Um, sure. Coming from a layperson's perspective, assuming there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be tuning in for the first time, what is integrative medicine and, um, and what's, what's the best way to understand it from a layperson's perspective? Okay, so I see that um, there's a misconception almost in every single patient I counsel. So you get complementary sort of like integrative. So you can put them in the same ball. Alternative is when a patient goes, nope, I don't want any normal conventional treatment. I'm going on to natural treatment. That's alternative. Integrative slash complementary health means, okay, we're going to work with our oncologists and we're going to work with the natural stuff and bring it all together into one, which is the way to go these days. Because And a lot of doctors realize that it's not one way or that way. It's about bringing it together to build a patient's trust. And because, you know, we've all heard the conspiracy theories of big pharma and, you know, doctors making medicine or sick. Uh, making money or giving chemo just to anyone so we've all heard the conspiracy theories and so it's good for patients to know that there are doctors that are open to it and they wait for the patient to come discuss it with them but I find a lot of patients are too embarrassed or too shy or too skeptic to tell their doctors that they take in all this stuff so and that's where a massive problem comes in but that's um, basically uh, what the difference between integrative, conventional and stuff like that. Conventional treatment will mean you just go on to what the doctor says and you don't use any supplements or any other therapies during your treatment. It's a hybrid of, of both, you would say? Yes. 
And at, does, does integrative medicine kick in at any time during a cancer patient's journey? Or are you limited in terms of, well, you're at stage four, therefore this won't work for you? No, so the only problems with supplements is that everyone thinks, you know, it's natural. So it's good for you, it can't do any harm, it's anything like that. And the problem is we must remember even cyanide comes and arsenic comes from our environment, you know. So a lot of them have the misconception of it's natural. Why do I have to tell my doctor? It's not going to do anything. But more often than not, majority of supplements interfere with chemo, they interfere with radiation, they interfere with surgery, they can interfere with a hormone blockade that they might take, whether it's tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. And that is the problem. And one of the reasons why I try and create awareness of to tell the patient, you have to tell your doctor you're taking this. Um, there was a case of a woman that was going into surgery and she listed all her medications into the hospital file, but hadn't told the doctor. And she was on things like ginger, cinnamon, curcumin and that, which increase your bleeding risk. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a problem like, wait, you're taking all these supplements, but you can too much of it and you can bleed like as if you were taking aspirin. So that's where... I find the biggest misconceptions with the patients and the reasons why they won't tell their doctors. And this majority of them do interfere with either hormones or treatments or surgery. Sure. So, um, Kiara, when you say like cinnamon and that, um, are you referring to actual supplements, tablet, tablet yeah. supplements, not spices and the, oh, fresh, no. the fresh spice that you're putting sort of into our... Lady. Yes, but how I explain it to the patients is if it comes in a tablet or a capsule or an oil that you're going to use in it, that's what's the problem. Not if you're going to go and make yourself pumpkin pie with cinnamon. Sure, so thank that, you. No <laughs> that is okay. So, um, yeah, I see, I've seen a lot of wacky stuff, um, really wacky stuff. Um, you know, manufacturers and they like to put these long scientific names you know that makes yeah. it look all important but yet you when you google it it's something uh, not google it research it, it's something simple like licorice or something like that and mm -hmm. i've seen supplements that contain snake skin crushed up cockroaches everything wow. which the patients have no they're not aware that they're taking it because um they they see these fancy names and they don't know what it is and yet sometimes it's the most simple thing it's just they try to make it look fancy sure and and kiara um when you in certain stages or let's say for example someone's recently just found out that they've been diagnosed with a type of cancer um and they are very against doing the, you know, the common treatments, which are your radiation, chemo, et cetera, or surgery. Um, and you're having to give this um, patient an alternative um, in terms of, of where, they, where they are and where they're wanting to go with how they're going to treat their cancer. What would you say to someone that's on that journey specifically and, and doesn't want to have surgery or perhaps isn't in a good um, state in terms of health, um, could be an elderly person, could be someone that's very frail, um, that probably wouldn't manage chemo and or surgery, um, and they're wanting an alternative, obviously, to look at, which is going to benefit them, and, you know, so they're on that, that cross path of where do I kind of go, what do I do, what would we say to that, that patient? Uh, I see um, uh, quite a few patients want to do that. Unfortunately, where their info comes is the Facebook conspiracy or YouTube conspiracy and that or somebody's auntie's uncle, whatever, died from their chemo and that. And what I try to do is explain to the patient, even chemo came from the environment, came from tree box, flowers, roots, mushrooms, and all of that. But you can't go sit in a forest and stick a piece of tree bark in you and say, that's it, I'm treating my cancer. Humans are specialized. We need specific doses at specific times and stuff like that. So, but when you do get a patient that is like, no, I don't want the chemo, I don't want the radiation, I don't want the surgery, then, you know, in the end, it is a patient's right to choose what they want. You know, it's, it, we can counsel them and advise them as much as we want, but we can't force them. So normally, like what we do is we give them three months. So three months, if you determine to try this treatment, 
try it for three months, but you've got to have a radiology follow-up. See what that cancer is doing, whether it's ultrasounds or CT scans, and you've got to see um, what it's doing. And unfortunately, more often than not, the cancers have progressed. They've metastasized. They, and then they come back and they go, okay, now I want the chemo, but it becomes harder to treat because they used a lot of things, especially in the hormonal cancers, and they take all those supplements, and there's so many influential hormones, and the cancer just looks at it as a buffet, like, yay, you're feeding me. Sure. And so we've had lots of elderly people. Um, you get the ladies that say, no, I don't, I don't want surgery. You know, I'm old now. I, I just don't want surgery. And there's various methods that you can use for that patient like a lot of them have hormone sensitive cancers so you just put them on an endocrine blockade and I actually did a study on it and there's a lot of geriatric patients that went on to the um, hormone blockades and they did quite fine but please I'm stipulating this for certain patients not all patients you get many different types of cancers and it's something you would have to discuss with your doctor and then when we got a frail little old lady and she's got a really bad cancer you know there's ways to work around the chemo it doesn't have to be like in your face scary there's always ways to work with chemo yeah. and i've seen ladies sail through chemo i swear except for the hair loss you wouldn't even say they're on chemo yeah. i've had ladies that have had a very hard time and that's when i've been in the complementary health thing to see what i can help with and i have ladies that have different reactions every single chemo is a different reaction so it's what I generally advise the patient is like okay let's start on the treatment see what side effects you get and we manage those as you get them don't shove a whole bunch of supplements and everything into your body that you might not need because you're scared and you might not experience it so it's generally that's the roundabout advice I give I do try and counsel them because more often than not the reason why they say no is from horror stories it's like when everyone's pregnant everyone's got a horror story about being pregnant oh my gosh the nausea and it's the same when you're diagnosed with cancer the people that come out of the woodworks with their horrifying stories and you know they mean well but the only thing they're doing is damaging the patient yeah. So, we, I mean, when you're diagnosed, you're terrified. you like a deer in the headlights and you get what we call information overload because there's all this information and they're struggling to keep it in and that. And I generally always recommend bringing in a notepad and a pen or somebody with you that can listen and that. And when they've been terrified so much by friends or Facebook or YouTube or whatever, then they come back going, no, 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 I can't have chemo, I'm going to die. There's been too many people that die with chemo. And, you know, it's a problem. Um, there was a paper released that patients who take alternative therapies are at a high risk of dying sixfold. And while if you use complementary or integrative, your chances of survival increase fivefold. So to say no to all the conventional medicine is actually very detrimental. Um, I'm not saying there's doctors that haven't done it and stuff, but my, me personally, in all the years I've been here and all the patients I've seen, I haven't seen it work, which is sad because, you know, the, you want the patients to feel comfortable with their treatment. And when they go for alternative treatment and they come back, you know, it's not like you can say, I advised you, you know, it's because it's their right in the end. But it, it is a huge problem these days with social media. Um, and um, Kiara, could you tell us um, what, are, what does integrative medicine include and um, an example of um, integrative medicine? So integrative is everything that's um, natural or complementary to the body. So integrative is very broad. So you can have all the supplements and the herbal medications and IV therapy. It also includes things like reflexology, acupuncture, Reiki, um, stress relief, media, uh, meditation, stuff like that. So it's very broad. It's extremely broad. Um, so for the ladies that are experiencing menopause and they can't go on to their hormone treatment because they've had a hormone sensitive cancer, things like acupuncture and diet can control menopausal symptoms incredibly well. And funny enough, it's the Mediterranean diet that can help control menopause, you know? So 
and it, that being Italian is very easy for me to explain to the patients what a Mediterranean diet is, but it's actually proven to work with acupuncture and then some zinc and magnesium is proven to work. Does cannabis fall under that definition for you? Yes, yes. Cannabis, the drug of this century, you know, everyone treats it as a one-stop wonder drug. You know, it's going to, um, I had a, a lady asking for advice and she wanted to come off a lot of her medication, which was for cholesterol, water retention and all of that. She wanted to use cannabis and I had to explain to her, cannabis won't do anything for that. It's not going to. Um, cannabis can be used for like pain, sleep, anxiety, those kind of things. But unfortunately, with all these bogus sites and that out there, a lot of people go, no, if I drink cannabis, that's it, I'm gonna cure my cancer. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work like that. So, I mean, what, the research is very promising. It is very promising, but we are not there yet. Um, it's gonna take a long time. And then they are going to change it into a tablet or that because we need controlled doses you know it's not go okay let's go take seven drops of that and we're good to go it's going to be concentrated biochemically copied and turned into a treatment and that's where a lot of patients get confused especially with chemo and that we copy it to put it in our labs it's not something like oh my gosh you know um so there's a lot of misconceptions on convention but cannabis Everyone wants to use it to treat everything. And just like any other medication, natural or conventional, everything has its limits. But it is sometimes the biggest thorn in my side. I am very pro-cannabis. It definitely has a place in a medicine. So I am pro-cannabis. Um, for the patients that it's safe to take, I do recommend it. Um, obviously with the go-ahead from their treating team. Okay, so they, I always tell the patients, check with every single doctor you are with that they are happy you taking this. And a lot of doctors are open to it. But the main problem I have with cannabis is people think it can treat cancer and we're not there yet. Yeah. And I think, um, as you say, a lot of people have that in mind. I mean, I know with um, when my mom was ill and um, uh, she had literally six weeks from diagnosis to passing. Um, and when we had received the news uh, when she eventually went to um, oncology on the 18th of January, and they said, look, you know, a state of health, she's been bedridden, she's, you know, the, the cancer's so advanced, there's really nothing you can do, take her home and, you know, keep her palliative. Yeah. And I was like, at first I thought to myself, what on earth are they talking about? Like, we're living in the 20th century, how can there be no treatment? I mean, really? You know, those are the, like the first questions that go through your mind. And then you come to realize, okay, now we've moved from that sort of scenario. So automatically your mind's functioning into, okay, there's a, there's a scenario two, right? There must be. Um, yeah. You're thinking, okay, now you've been told to take her home and give her palliative care, which opens up an entire new sort of window because you're thinking, what is palliative care? Um, and then you're going, okay, well, they say there's no treatment in terms of surgery and or chemo radiation. Um, perhaps we need to try the alternative, which is going to be the cannabis, you know, and I suppose, and maybe from your experience, I mean, you, you get um, family members, especially, I mean, I know with myself, we had huge family issues internally between myself and my brother and my siblings, because they were like, you know, we're, we're not giving up. And of course, you never want to give up, right? You, you, we never give up. But they were so convinced in their mind that if she goes on to cannabis, it's going to prolong and cure you know, which is the, as you mentioned now, it's, it's the association that you have with it that is going to cure the cancer. But as you say, it's, it hasn't gotten to that point yet. So perhaps, yeah. you know, maybe your thoughts on that when, when a family or a person is in that situation where they, you know, they have been told there's nothing you can do and they're thinking perhaps the next alternative is the cannabis treatment. Um, you know, for someone that's never, ever taken it and that's, you know, at that staging in their, in their cancer, um, how is that going to affect them if they all of a sudden just went onto it and, you know, not knowing what the dosages are? I mean, you know, what is the, I suppose what I'm getting at is what is the negative that could come from someone being so interested in doing it, but not knowing, you know, where the limitations are, how much? So there's a lot of problems. Um, we've also got to remember cannabis can drop your sugar. 
all right? If you're diabetic, you have to watch your sugar. Cannabis can also interfere with wound healing and bleeding. So I always tell the patients two weeks before surgery, two weeks after surgery, no cannabis at all. But, you know, with some types of palliative care, when there is a point you get to, it's all about making the patient comfortable. So if they want to take so many things in that, you know, it's not going to make much difference to their diagnosis. And, you know, if that's what calms them, the cannabis, and they say, nope, I don't want anything else, that's what I want, then you allow the patient to do it. And uh, the arguments that you um, spoke about now, you'll be surprised, are very frequent, very frequent. Sure. So it's sad. it's sad to sometimes see what cancer can do to a family, because it doesn't only just affect the patient, it affects the whole family. Yeah. So... I actually published a paper on daughter caregivers being the, at the highest risk of anxiety and depression. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And I can relate to that. I mean, my sister and I were my mom's carers, um, you know, uh, during those six weeks and it comes with tremendous um, responsibility and or, you know, this, this, this pressure of wanting to solve, you know, and um, I think one of the challenges I faced when that option was presented to us with cannabis was what happens like if it, if it affects mom, because my mom's never been someone that's ever taken anything foreign other than maybe smoke a cigarette, you know, when she wasn't, you know, with my dad or, you know, with social environments, et cetera. So for her now to put her into a situation where we're saying, mom, try this, you know, you might go feel a bit, you know, my, my fear or, or, or what, what's the word for fear, I suppose, was what happens if she takes it and then all of a sudden, you know, she sees things that are there but not there, you know, how do we deal? <laughs> is that something that happens? Yes, it is. So since cannabis became legal, I use the quote marks, please, um, they, everyone and their dog thinks they can make the oil. I promise you, you've got all these chemists sitting at home thinking they're going to make the best oil. So I see a lot of nonsense sold to the patients for a lot of money, which always makes me angry because, you know, you don't need to be mean to the patients, be fair. Um, and I see, I mean, I think one of the best stories I had was a little old lady and she phoned me and she goes, something's really wrong with me. So I'm, what's wrong? And she goes, no, I'm taking my drops, but I get dizzy and I'm getting so hungry. Oh, wow. And I tell her that maybe the drops were too strong and too much THC and she was getting the munchies and it's a common thing because people aren't told the correct dosage yeah. so the dosage you would give to um, a young person versus a geriatric is completely different geriatrics normally need half the dose otherwise they do experience the side effects so that does play a huge role because that was my worry. I thought, well, how am I going to deal with my mom now all of a sudden seeing things and saying to us, you know, there's a spaceship and I'm like, okay, mom, cool down. <laughs> okay, I haven't met any patients with hallucinations, so you see. Um, but, you know, if they don't know what they're getting and they don't know the dosage and they're just squirting it under their tongue or gums or I've seen everything the way it's applied, um, then when they start feeling dizzy and that, a lot of them don't know it's the product they've bought. So it, you always have to become a repeatable person. It's very, very important. Not, I mean, I knew a patient that used to get it from the cashier at Lee's, you know? So right. you've got to make sure you go in some way that is reputable and they can tell you how they've made their oils or drops or creams or whatever. And so that you know what you are taking just like if you take a panado or any type of medication and you don't know it, I mean, what do we do? We read the package insert. Yeah. It's the same with cannabis. You have to know there's so many different strains and sativas and indicas and all of that. So if you're going to smoke it or take them, you've got to know what you're putting in your body. Yeah. Thank you for that, Kiara. We have a question from Nikki. Nikki, would you like to? Yes. Please go ahead. Please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Oh, well, yourself. Okay. Uh, last time I spoke to you was about two years ago, Kiara. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to ask, because um, I vaguely remember, possibly through my own research at the time, um, the danger of taking certain types of cannabis if you were, for instance, hormone positive uh, cancer. Um, I don't know if it was the THC, um, 
volume or, or, or the case. I, I can't remember. Is my understanding correct? So, the, like I said, the research is still, I mean, new. Um, but the problem is, is that there's papers that say you can use it with hormone cancer, papers who say you can't use it with hormone cancer. So I have a rule of thumb, if there's small smoke, there's small fire. So until the research is definite, it's not worth the risk to mess up your treatments and so forth. You're going on to the treatment to battle your cancer. You want to get through it and everything. So, you know, it's got to be careful. Like I see with HER2 positive breast cancer patients, when they're on their Herceptin, if they use cannabis, their Herceptin doesn't work as well. So it's, it's something that you've always got. I research a lot of things and I try and find more yeses than noes. But if I'm finding out there's a lot of noes and I'm like, mm, you know, it's not researched enough. So let's just not take the risk. Thank you. Thanks for that. Another, another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think I, I actually asked Kiara the same thing. Um, with CBD oil, you know, just to help you sleep better because I get my hot flushes. And I mean, uh, Prof. Demetra said, no way, it's just leave it alone. But I mean, you said, so like you say, I mean, another scary thing when I, just after I was diagnosed and I started my tamoxifen, I um, was having hot flushes and I went to my pharmacy. That was before, I, I mean, I'd even knew about Cura. And I mean, the pharmacist actually was happy to recommend sort of over-the-counter supplements that had Black Oshkosh and some of that other stuff in it that actually is um, contradictory to tamoxifen as well. And I mean, this was coming from the pharmacy. And I mean, so you've got qualified pharmacists also not really even knowing or aware of the, you know, the, you know, the contraindications of, you know, certain things with, with cancer medications. It's, it's actually fairly um, common that that happens because there's a joke that you know when you study medicine only one week is dedicated to supplements so it's because there's become a huge interest in supplements more research is being done and some doctors know but majority don't and it's none of their fault because they haven't been taught it um, I don't know many people who do what I do um, with raising awareness over supplements and that. So it's pretty common that doctors and pharmacists and nurses don't know unless they've spent time looking into it. So it's it's something that's new, not as as not as old as conventional medicine, should I say? Thank you. Thanks for that. Another question that's come through in terms of integrative medicine and being covered by medical aid? Is it covered at all? Um, generally, no, to be honest. Generally, no. Um, it's uh, rather unfair if you think about it because there's a lot of things uh, that patients can benefit from with integrative care. And it's something I do wish the medical aids would recognize because a lot of these therapists, whether it's arts or music therapy and that, you know, they want to see the patients, but especially when you've got cancer, your financial burden increases. And then they can't afford it because their medical aid doesn't pay for it. And that is a problem. So I wish medical aids would pay for it. There's a lot of help out there that could help and help their members. You just mentioned something quickly. I just want to jump on it quickly. Um, you mentioned musical and art therapy. Um, assuming, of course, then that that falls under the integrative medicine Anna, could you just perhaps just elaborate a little bit about that? So there's been some articles in the Bosom Buddies and um, they've found that patients who are struggling with anxiety and the chemo side effects, you know, going to an art class, even if you're not Picasso and just painting and that or going to learn an instrument or learn um, how the music can help you, um, stuff like that. It's it's new, it's fairly new. We've got it on the pink parasol. And from what the people I've met and the stories I've heard and that it works beautifully. It's all about relaxation because when we're stressed, our bodies release adrenaline. It, um, it upsets our stomachs, our hearts, our brains, everything. So the whole point is to be as relaxed as you can. And that's when a lot of the music therapy, art therapy, um, stress relief, you get stress relief therapy, cranial sacral, all of those can help the patient get rid of the anxiety. 
gifts who not because you know healing is no longer just about the body it's mind it's spiritual it's emotional it's all about one care and to heal yourself in as an entire person and things like that can reduce anxiety and actually help patients um, cope better with their chemo or radiation interesting thank you and perhaps while we're talking about the the, the sort of types of complementary um, medicine, um, I read a little bit about mind-body alternative um, biological-based treatments um, and energy therapies. Is there anything else um, that you would recommend or suggest? It depends on what it's for. Okay. So, um, you know, like if a patient's struggling with a chemo and struggling to eat, then what I do is I normally... Uh, sorry, refer them to a dietitian because, you know, you need to keep the same amount, some nutrients and some protein and stuff like that. And if they're struggling, the best thing to do is to go see a dietitian. So integrative care is very broad, but I can't suggest, okay, this will cover all of it. It all depends what the patient needs, that what I recommend. And um, the other the other question that we had was, um, what is the risk of alternative medicine? It's what I said in the earlier is um, with the cancer patients, they go and try to come back three months later and the cancer's bad. I've seen ladies refuse, you know, they've gone through the surgery, but then they refuse their endocrine blockade and they go into their natural treatments and then they come back with a recurrence or metastases so they went through their surgery they did it but then they refused the treatment and the cancers come back so it's for me those are the very traumatic stories because you you see a person that's okay i'm having my surgery and i'm going to beat this cancer but then not realize the supplements they're taking are causing more harm so for me those are the very sad stories that you know i wish I wish social media was more regulated to stop some the damage that it's doing. Yeah. Does anybody have a question that we'd like to share or, or ask Kiara something? Okay. Hi, Kiara. Hi. Hi. Um, if the supplements are doing the damage, how do you know which are the good and the bad supplements? So what I do is I research interactions. So um, there are certain supplements that if you take during chemo, it will reduce the efficacy of the chemo, but make it more toxic. So when the patient's feeling miserable, they blame the chemo and not look at their supplements. So it's research. It's honest research. What you can during chemo, you might not be able to do radiation. And what you can do radiation, you can't, maybe can't do in surgery. So it's actually something you have to research each stage mm -hmm. of the patient's journey. I mean, I've lost count how many supplements I've researched. I wish I could remember them all. Um, but there's so much out there. There is so much. Um, there's dandelion and licorice and black um, yeah. They It's impossible to keep up with all of them. So if a patient comes to me and they go, that's it, I've heard about this, will it help? And then I spend the next couple of days researching it, comparing it to the medicine they're on and say, yeah, your name. It's complicated because when I started my uh, my chemo at at uh, at Ravonia Oncology, they gave me a box of well, actually it wasn't. They didn't give me the box. They gave me the list of all the things I might need, and they were all really not so much supplements, really more treatments for symptoms like dryness of the mouth, whatever nausea, and some of these things completely conflicting. And as it turned out. I, I, I needed very few of those, but obviously some people do need those yeah. particular treatments. Yeah. When they give a list of side effects, it's the same as if you look at any medication. You know, in research, if somebody felt like a um, sore pinky toe, you know, it's stuff that they've got a list in that. So when the patients give get their little pamphlet of side effects, I normally tell them, don't stress. does not mean you're going to get all of them. But yeah, um, yeah it's you know, and the things like the dry mouth and cracked lips and that those are always good tips to follow because it's been tried and tested over many years and it's known to work. So my research stands more like with supplements, herbal medicines and that because generally what the doctors suggest, they have no issues. Kiara, the questions come through. Your thoughts on collagen supplements? 
Okay, so funny enough, I've actually been asked to write an article on that for the next issue of Buddies. Um, yeah, so there's research showing that collagen can help with wrinkles, tighten the skin, can help with bone density. Um, so it's, you know, for the ladies that can, you know, if they want to, they can take collagen. I've never seen any interactions. I've never found any during research in that. But um, there is research showing for skin and bones, um, but not much other stuff. You know, there is no other research showing all the other stuff they get told you can take it for, or like depression and stuff like that. It's better to always stick with what the research is showing until the research changes, until somebody finds something else, which always happens with research. It's a continuous thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And your thoughts on oxygenation therapy? Um, personally, so this is my personal opinion, I don't like it because, you know, oxygen is needed in your body, but you have no proof in saying that it's not going, the oxygen's not going to be good. You know, some people believe it, some people don't. There's not much um, research out on it, but personally, me, I don't like it for a cancer treatment. I don't like it. It's another thing I've seen not Thank you. So can, can we talk about the practicalities of someone wanting to um, sit down with you and be assessed? Could you just tell us, take us through the process of, is it a kind of needs analysis? Someone comes and sees you and you ask them, just so for those listeners out there who perhaps would like to approach you, what are their expectations, costs, timing, things like that? Yes. Yeah, so what they normally do is they book an appointment to see me and we go through what their fears are, what they are hoping for, you know, are they scared of neuropathy, you know, and we can discuss different ways to tackle it and um, just take it from there. It is in individual patient based. So they come to me, they tell me what they want, you know, what they are taking or what's been suggested. And we work together. We work together to make sure nothing they're going to take is going to interfere with treatment or surgery, but going to actually be beneficial for the patient. So it's just a matter of assessing what they want. And do you dispense the supplements based on their needs and what you've seen? No. No, because I'm completely neutral. Um, I don't believe in punting brands. I have the most lovely reps come in to see me with really good supplements. So if I do see one, <clears throat> that's very good. Like a Jenny for vitamin B, I recommend Nerobian because it gives you what you want. It's, it's absorbed well, you know, it's not just being excreted in urine type scenarios. So that is one thing, but it's never a brand of like, oh no, you're only gonna use supplements from this company. I don't punt brands. I, I don't believe in it. I'm not a sales rep, so I don't think it's ethical from my side at all. Is your involvement a kind of holding hands through the journey process? Or do you yeah. diagnose and then, yeah. No, I navigate patients. They all get my cell phone number because in case they see something on social media or someone suggested it as something. And I navigate them. I also do palliative and bereavement. So, you know, it's literally from start to finish. And in terms of costing and things like that, could you just get a, give us an indication as to what you charge and how that works? So currently there is no charge to see me because I'm still studying, so it's unethical to take a fee. So, but to me, it's always been like, come see me. You know, I'm not interested in how to charge or get money. It's just like, phone me, make an appointment. Let's see how we can help you. It's, but I've always been like that. It's, um, there's a joke from one of the ladies in the room, because when I qualify, I go, free treatment for family and friends. And she goes, you know, you're going to be broke. <laughs> So it, that, that's me. I want to work in government hospitals and I'm happy to see anyone or them call me or message me. That just, it's never a problem. Sorry, just one more question and then over to Evie. No, no, um, what's the youngest person that you've treated? Um, that I've counseled, I would say early 20s, maybe around younger than 25, early 20s. You do see a, a lot of young breast cancer patients these days. Yeah. So, um, and I think I've, counseled up to an 85 year old so really across the spectrum so yeah but I can't like say this is what I do this is what I recommend because I have to see the patients or I have to talk to them 
and see what they actually want in. And can integrative medicine work for any age? As far as you know. And could you put could you a, a, a baby or a child through? I don't, I don't recommend, I can't recommend that on a child because I have not studied pediatrics. I have, none of my research has been in pediatrics. That, um, because childhood cancers are extremely different to adult cancers, you know, childhood cancers tend to develop faster, more aggressive. I am not comfortable at all giving an opinion on a child where I always say to the parents, because a few have contacted me, please speak to your oncologist. Mm -hmm. This is not something I can advise you on and I won't take that risk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so as for all ages, it goes back to what do they want? You know, if a geriatric patient comes to me and she goes, I'm so sore, I've heard about cannabis, I've got to tell her dosage, be very careful of dosage because you're older. I have a younger person comes to me saying, oh no, they've read this and this and this and they want to take all of them and spend 8,000 Rand on it. You know, then I gently advise them as well. It's extremely expensive supplements. You know, let's, let's take it back a notch and see actually what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. And that brings me back to my irritation of people sometimes really overcharging unnecessarily. Um, it, it's honestly an individual based needs. Got it. Thank you. Thanks. Lisa. And Kiara, can I, yeah, can I ask um, In terms of all the, the different, I mean, as you said, there's so many millions of vitamins and supplements available at the skim and all these places. I mean, how do you distinguish which is good and which is bad? I mean, you know, some are like extremely expensive, some are cheap. So, I mean, I know that is also, I think, so confusing for people to, you know, which, which one is actually going to work. I mean, so for, I mean, I'll probably have some dietitians correcting me on this, but generally what I recommend is looking at the RDA of the required amount daily allowance that you need and stuff like that. And quite often you don't need the expensive brands. You know, if, you know, you also got to take blood tests, you know, to make sure it's your vitamin D levels are not low in there because too much vitamin D can actually make you feel exhausted. So you've got to make sure you're also not overdosing on supplements. So it doesn't necessarily mean more expensive is better. Just you've got to know your product and you've got to know that you're taking the right amount and that you're not overdosing on something because our bodies also at a point will stop absorbing and they'll just peer it out to what we call expensive urine because you've spent all this money and you're literally peeing it away. So um, the best thing is to do is to look at the formula look at how much it's giving you look if it's going to be of any benefit but more often than not any brands are generally the same how do we manage expectations when someone comes and sees you Kiara? um so it depends again on the expectations you know if a patient comes to me and they're going that's it taking vitamin c iv i'm going to do cannabis i'm going to do hydrogen peroxide and oxygen therapy because that's going to cure my cancer that is their expectation. And when they're determined like that, you have to let them try because that's what they want, even if you advise against it. So expectations, unfortunately, with integrative medicine, it's, it's more individually based than even conventional medicines. So um, expectations can be anything. I don't want to feel neuropathy during my chemo. I don't want to have the tingling. Okay, so I know of a very good cream that's cannabis-based that will help with that. And let me know if it doesn't work. And, you know, menopausal, now I want to stop having my hot flushes. I want to stop being moody. I'm over it. Okay, let's try a Mediterranean diet, some zinc and magnesium and acupuncture. Let's see if it works for you. And so, unfortunately, it's very broad. Do you think... And I suppose I know the answer, but I'm asking the question anyway. Is it preferable to start engaging with patients before they hit the onset of symptoms? Because you're mentioning things now, you know, that people are already along the, along the line and they're feeling all of these kind of weird things. You, you it, I do prefer to meet them on first consult mm -hmm. because, um, like, they, they don't reveal what they're on because they're either forgotten or they're embarrassed or they think it's not important. Mm -hmm. So I do so that when they come to me during chemo, 
I don't have to say, oh my gosh, the supplements you're taking definitely doesn't help. You know, I prefer to see them before they start any treatment. So I can also understand their fears, um, their anxiety, stuff like that, because it's fear and anxiety that also pushes a lot of people to, uh, to alternative medicines. So I like to see them before and go, you know what, here's myself a number. We're going to work through it together. Let's see how fast this goes and take it from there. When, when you say they don't reveal what they are on, um, that must make it quite complicated for you. Yes, yes, it does. So um, we do have a handout in our file where I've asked, I uh, ask patients their opinions on natural supplements. Do they think it will interfere in that? And when I phone the patients and I go, do you take anything? Like what? Supplements, herbs, anything of that? No, no, I don't. And then they go, wait. I think I take a funny herb. I'm not sure what it's called. I'll send you a picture. Yeah. They, they, they forget. They think it's not important. You well, know, they're, they're extremely important. It's extremely important to know your supplements mm -hmm. and what it can do. Because I'm not just talking chemo and radiation. These supplements that can interfere with your diabetic medication, your hypertensive medication. They interfere a lot. So you've got to be very careful. And it's... That's why awareness is so much needed around supplements because a lot of doctors don't know either or pharmacists and they say, no, this is okay, take it. But you've got to look for drug interactions. Any questions, anybody else at this stage? Anybody yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that um, I had genetic testing like two years ago, Just we just did it as a family and um, you know we did all, all of the different sectors and I mean, I actually tested my to see if I had the SIP2 D gene, which is a gene that actually says whether you actually absorb tamoxifen, which is the endocrine hormonal treatment that I'm on for my breast cancer for the next 10 years. So, and I mean, that was quite interesting. Like, I had a normal, you know, my SIP2 D gene, I had it and it was normal. And I got sent a whole list of medications that. They said I shouldn't take, um, you know, while I'm on the tamoxifen because it could reduce. So it's also, I mean, I think if patients can afford genetic testing, you know, you can ask for, you know, you can, I think you, you also get quite a good um, indication of, especially if you're on certain treatments, probably like hormonal treatment where you're going for many years, I think it was really worse. And I think it's nice to know, you know, for myself and, Prof. Dimitra said, you know, with the research, you know, they, it, it's not 100% foolproof that if you have that gene, it will, you know, it, it does work. But I think if you can afford, you know, genetic testing, I think, I don't know what you think, Kiara, I think it can also help in some ways. So a lot of the genetic testing out there, please, I'm not saying it all, so I hope no one gets offended. I don't believe in I don't. Um, because it's much more complicated than saying, oh, wait, you got a gene, don't eat this food. You know, it, you've got to know what you're doing in that. So I, I'm very skeptical about these quick genetic tests. Um, I believe you should always have a genetic counselor to work you through it, work through any possible findings and stuff like that. So I'm skeptical of them. And I think perhaps Steve, maybe, maybe, uh... Steve can share a little bit about his genetic testing. Um, recently, I think he, he did some, some uh, genetic testing through, I don't know if Steve can hear us, Steve? He's very involved with something else. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting for him to have shared what kind of um, um, genetic testing he did. But I mean, um, it's interesting to hear, you, to hear you say that, yeah, because um, when, when my mom was diagnosed, um, and my mom's mom also had um, and passed from ovarian cancer. Um, my mom then had originally uh, diagnosed in the late 20s and early 30s twice with breast cancer um, and then um, passed uh, due to the ovarian cancer in the, at, at a late 68 years old. But um, it, never, it never rang as a thing to do, I suppose, because number one, she never spoke about it. And number two, we never thought of even doing genetic testing because... Yeah. We didn't talk about cancer, so, you know, leave it behind. So two different types of genetic testing. I'm talking about the kits that you can get um, that Nicole had, 
and then the genetic testing, I think you talk about the just, was, It wasn't just a kit, so we had it through Greenway, and we had actually proper um, counseling and feedback and, um, you know, the whole panel discussion for like two hours on each of our results. So it wasn't just the, it, it was quite... It was so what I mean is not the genetic testing for BRCA or whatever. I'm with Prof. Demetrio on this, is that there's no research show, not real research showing that if you've got that gene, it's not gonna work. Yeah. It's, it's not as simple as that, should I say. So when it comes to the genetic testing like BRCA and stuff like that, I, I'm fine with those, I'm secure with those. But the other ones, I would need to see more research to have more faith in them. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that patients shouldn't have it. Um, I'm saying that if it is found with maybe something you can't eat or can't take, it's something you should also always check with your doctor, um, not just read the handout and go, okay, it's cool. So always check with your doctor. And Kiara, you mentioned in the beginning that a lot of um, oncologists are quite happy to work alongside integrative medicine. Um, what happens in a situation where a patient's gone to see an oncologist and um, that specific oncologist does not allow and or recommend integrative running concurrently with, with what they've prescribed? I mean, is there ever a situation where that's happened? Perhaps a yep. patient wanting to do it, but then ask the oncologist that he's so against it or he or she's against it and doesn't recommend it. Um, are they entitled to leave and go for another opinion? I mean, I know they should always get more than one opinion, but perhaps it's someone that's, you know, in their life and in their family or being referred to and they're scared to perhaps, you know, leave them and go somewhere else, but now they've been told they can't, you know, do this. How can we give some advice to someone in that situation? So you're right. A patient's around, allowed as many opinions as they want, even if it's 10. You know, if a, a patient has to feel comfortable with their doctor, got to be happy. And there's a few things that happen. You know, when the doctor goes, no, I counsel the patient saying, listen, they're worried about interaction, but you're starting chemo for a goal, kill the cancer. Yeah. So let's not put anything in there that's going to mess up the chemo because we're working towards one goal and that's to kill the cancer. So you have to work together. I, the oncologist is the primary treating doctor. That is the one when I have a patient going, okay, I'm going to, to um, take this and this and this, and the oncologist says no. I say to them, your oncologist is the one to listen to. Yeah. And Kiara, where, where are you based? I'm at Mill Park Hospital. Okay. That's From next week, I will be in government hospitals as well. So I'm only at Mill Park then in the afternoon. Okay. So we will share Kiara's details. Oh, sorry, Nikki, go ahead. Go ahead, Nikki. I just want to ask Kiara, and I promise I'm not trying to punt Nicole, <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, is exercise also seen as part of integrative medicine? Yes. Um, sorry, let me just turn this down. Um, yes, it is. Biokinetics, physiotherapy, all of that is. But with exercise, you've got to get the go ahead. You can't have a double mastectomy and then two weeks later, that's it, I'm running the comrades. Um, or doing <laughs> um, so it's it's it is part of it exercise is good for us it's really good for us yeah. you know it's yeah. just hard to get into you you know you've got to put on the tackies but it's like the bed looks so much more comfortable yeah. so especially if you've gone through chemo or radiation where you're really tired and it's just you just can't <laughs> You have to be kind to your body, though. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to your body. And if your body's tired, take that nap. If your body's hungry, eat that food. You know, if, if you just want to... Now, don't advocate sugar all the time, so please. And, you know, as the problem us ladies have is we don't hang up our superwoman capes. We no. don't. We run everything. We take care of everything. Mm -hmm. And we've got to remind ourselves to put down the cape. And if you want to sit in the bed for one day with a jar of Nutella and a spoon, you have to allow yourself those days to carry on being strong. Um, like uh, my children are very chronically ill. And um, so they have their off days. And I always say to them, you know what? You're allowed to be angry. You're allowed to be upset as long as you get up the next day. 
you know and that's where exercise can help as well it improves mood it improves joint pain it helps with weight it helps it even helps with hot flushes but the yep. the patients have to get there first yeah 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 don't can worry I just say something sorry you know, Kiara, i mean as nikki as i said to you i mean even myself um as Kiara said you you've got to be so careful and you've got to know exactly what you're doing in referring exercise for cancer patients um, and knowing when when to refer out, as Kiara says, you know, that, that that is so important. And like you say, I mean, if you are absolutely exhausted, um, then listen to your body. It, 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 you know, um, that I think that is the whole key. And as Kiara said, I think the biggest issues, as Carol and I always debate, is, is getting into exercise. Um, I mean, normal people find it hard to exercise. So for cancer patients, you know, it's even more difficult. Um, but I think the, the key is to try and be consistent. I mean, and that is for any form of exercise. So normally what I recommend when it comes to the exercise is I recommend that they see a biokineticist and a physiotherapist once they got the go ahead from their doctors. Because especially a biokineticist is trained on how to teach you to train. So I, I really always recommend biokineticists, physiotherapy, just to get you going. Because once you're in that groove, I'm sure, Nicole, you know what I'm meaning. It's easier to carry on. You know, you just got to get in there. No, exactly. It's so important to be assessed properly. Because um, like you say, otherwise you can do you know, a lot more damage you know, if, you, if they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> um, Kiara, please won't you share your details with us. Um, I will share them uh, on the link as well, but maybe for those that are listening and want to make contact with you, your, detail, your, your contact number, email address. So my email address is kiara at, the pink, at pinkparasol.coza. So it's the organization's name, my name, .coza. Um, my cell phone number is 082. 887-8268. Um, yeah, so I'm always, I'm used to being messaged and asked questions and so it's never a problem for me to give out my cell phone number because it's like, yeah, sure, let's, let's just help do it, you know, so I don't have a problem with that. That's awesome, thank you, and, and not, not many people are, are offer that, so it's awesome that you do that, so we appreciate it, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, a uh, very interesting topic. I, I, can go, I think we could go on for another hour, but um, uh, I've learned so much and I, I hope that this uh, session has opened up a lot of um, uh, Q and A's for those that are gonna be watching later and um, they might wanna contact you for some questions and answers. Um, I have to also thank our, our sponsors and our partners today, BMW Bryanston um, for sponsoring this session. So thank you to uh, Stavros and Charlene and Nicole from JSM Motors. And um, yeah, next week also got an interesting topic. We are chatting about uh, testicular cancer because April is Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. So we're joined next week by our favorite gentleman from the Cape, Torsten, and uh, we'll be chatting about- Oh, I love him, I've met him. He is yeah. such a wonderful person. He's really an amazing person. He is, and, and uh, he has an amazing story and his organization behind him that we partnered with. So we'll be sharing some of that info. So we look forward to seeing you all then. But a uh, huge thank you once again, Kiara, from our side. What a pleasure to have you today and uh, for taking the time out to speak to us. All our champions today, um, I see today's a, almost a 90% uh, champion session today. So thank you, Nikki. It's so lovely to see you and uh, we're glad to see you popping around and in and out again, uh, Steve and Nicole and Drika. And uh, Bobby has joined us from, from uh, Cancer. So thank you all again for joining us. It's been awesome, amazing. We're going to share the link as well as Kiara's details on our YouTube channel and on our WhatsApp group. So look out for those. And um, yeah, other than that, in closing, John, before we go. Fantastic session. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll be referring a lot of people to you. So you'll soon start to charge. Because you're really <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It, mm -hmm. it was really nice. Pleasure. With COVID, I've stopped most of my talks because normally I do them in person. So this was very nice. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of your studies. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you next Bye. time. Bye. Bye. Bye.